faith in God is demonstrated by your action. Now, everything I'm going to be sharing with you today, take it very seriously. You know, you know what the Bible tells us? It says, the Word of God, listen to this, look up now. It says, the Word of God is quick and powerful. That means living and active. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. Did I say chapter 12, verse 4, 4 verse 12? Am I mixing it up? Yeah. Give it to you. Yeah, 4 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. It says, the word of God is quick. That means living. It's alive. And active. The word of God, the logos of God, is living and active. Say living and active. Living and active. Say living and active. Active. The word of God is living. And active. Now look at this. When Jesus said to a man that could not walk, rise up. The word of God went into him and made him whole to be able to do what Jesus said. The word of God is living and active. Active. It works. It produces results. It says sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow. And is a designer of the thoughts. 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 And intents of the heart. He says the word of God can check your heart. That's the reason when we share the living word of God, you would begin to think someone told us about you. You would wonder, how did we know what you did? How did we get to know details about you? It's not the man. It is the word. It says the word is living and active. It is a designer of the thoughts and intents. It designs your thoughts. It designs your motives. It checks you. And the Bible says all things are unveiled to him with whom we have to do. That means the Word of God sees all things. You can't hide from the Word of God. You can't hide anything from the Word of God. The doctor may not know the cause of the cancer, but the Word of God knows the Word can see it. So when we preach the Word or teach the Word, the Word is heard, but unseen. Yet it travels in the Spirit. To go straight to the case and effect a change. The Word of God is living and active. Say amen. He yeah. says, look at something else here that's so beautiful. Dividing asunder. It says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. In other words, the Word of God can tell you the difference between the soul and the spirit. The Word of God can distinguish between the soul and the spirit. Man's human understanding doesn't know that. You know, 
some time ago I was sharing with you the difference between faith and believing. Many people don't understand that difference. You find someone who will be crying, Oh God, I believe. Oh God, I really know that you can do it. Oh God, do it for me today. Oh God. He is expressing his believing. That is not faith. But he does not know. And he may leave that crusade discouraged, unhappy, because he says to himself, if I have ever prayed in my life, that was the day I prayed. If I ever believed, that was the day I believed. If I ever had faith, that was faith. And then he leaves unhappy. Oh God, I didn't receive. But he did not know that what he had was not faith. There's a difference between believing and faith. You know, just like sometimes I look at business people today who don't understand that there is a difference between managing and administration. Many of them are in administration without realizing. And they destroy their organization thinking that they are managing. Many of so-called managers today are not managers. They are administrators. That is their problem. In managing, you deal with people, not papers. You deal with people, not policies. In administration, you don't recognize people. You recognize policies, precepts, regulations. Until you separate between the two, you can have problems in your business. Over and over, you keep wondering what the devil is that is present there. There's no devil. It's your misunderstanding. As was running down some of our banks and institutions, they don't realize it. I love what Kenneth Hagin says. You know, you can see that fellow with so many degrees. Kenneth Hagin says, the fellow went to school to learn to be a dummy. And that's sad. And managing is not laughter. Managing is not sitting down to find out what the trouble and the problem of that person is. Managing is learning to learn about people and being interested in them. And helping them to find their place in life with you. So even if there are two or three, if you can help them to find their place with you, help them to become what they should be, help them to answer their questions and solve their problems, that's true managing. That is what it is. You know, many times a lot of our schools are headed by people who have only learned the stuff they have from occultists of the world, including Satanists. So they teach you all the selfish things in this world. Selfish things. That assist, they're all in the system of this world. Which when you begin to apply, you think you are a pro. Until you discover that the system of this world was designed to fail. It can only go up for one reason. That its fall may be powerful. You know what that means. The higher it is, the more terrible the fall. Don't envy sinners. Don't use their principles to live. They cannot be successful. Believe what I'm telling you. Have you heard me? Let me take it another step further. I said, faith in God is demonstrated. It's demonstrated by your actions. You see, 
It's easy to look out for someone with the gift of healing and say, Oh, please pray for me. Heal me of this terrible problem. Do you know that you can be healed for one hour? The healing will come to you for only one hour. <laughs> Just to give you enough time to make up your mind about God. There are signs of healing. That God will perform a miracle in your life and then wait for you to demonstrate your faith in Him. Which if you won't demonstrate that faith in Him, the miracle will not last. This is the problem of many people. You know, somebody was asking a stupid question. But why are some not healed? Isn't that crazy? Why don't you also ask when you preach the word to sinners, why are some not converted to Christ? It's your faith in God. God cannot make you born again. If you believe, you shall receive. That's the law of the Spirit. When Jesus came, he brought healing to people. All right? He healed them now. Hey, come on. He brought healing now. 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 What we are doing now is to help you appropriate that which was already done. If you believe in Jesus, the cancer must not have power over you. If you believe in Jesus, AIDS should not have power over you. If you believe in Jesus, there should be no failure in your life. If you believe in Jesus, there should be no poverty in your life. Why are many still sick? Why are many still poor? Why are many still having frustrations in their lives? Because their believing is defective. Something is wrong with their believing. There is no good luck and there is no bad luck. Are you hearing me? There's no such thing as good luck and there's no such thing as bad luck. And you never have to think that, oh, those people there are specially favored, that family over there is specially favored, but, well, I don't know what my lot is. Maybe my lot is to be poor, is to be frustrated. This is what God's given to me. No! A thousand times no. A thousand times no. Your life can have a change. A complete change. A 180 degrees change. If you will only, only act on your believing. If you will only act on your believing. What have you done in your life as a demonstration of your faith in Jesus Christ? What is it you have done for him as a demonstration of your faith in Jesus Christ? There are sick people that will not be healed in spite of all the prayer. The sickness will depart because of the anointing and return because of their failure in faith. Ask, you who has been sick for five years, you were not born with it. Why did the sickness come? Five years ago. What brought it? If you are healed today, if the thing that cost it five years ago is not dealt with, that means the cause is still there. That means it will come again because you have not dealt with the cause 
You have not dealt with the root. God is not as concerned about the problem of sickness as some people think he is. Why? He's already done something about sickness. He wants you to do something about it. Where is your faith? If you're suffering today, how do you think God responds? Because he saw the suffering ahead of time, he sent the solution in Christ Jesus. He sent the solution in the word of God. What are you waiting for? Where is your faith? Believing is not faith. Faith is not believing. You demonstrate your faith in God in your action. Let me give you a simple example. Here is a man who has been a Christian for many years. He has never participated remarkably in his faith. Hey, did you ever read what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21? Come on, read it. Want to go? Again. One more time. Okay. You see, man is a very complex being. Very, very complex being. Have you ever seen someone... who is very sick... All right? They even have to feed him, help him, put food in his mouth. Have you ever seen him get angry at someone who's feeding him, even the person who's helping him? Have you ever seen that condition where he gets angry? He can't move his hand. All right? He's too sick to get up. He might just do something like this. You see, because the sickness is only in his body. He is in captivity, but he is still a person. You understand that? He is still a person with pride. I I remember I I was ministering to, to several people several months ago. And um, while laying hands on them, because many of them had been sick, on a Sunday service, there was a young man who was brought to the front. He was carried to the front, sitting in a chair. They brought him in that condition. He could move. Sitting in that chair, they carried him to the front. And I went to him. I said, what's the matter? He said, leukemia. I looked at him. I said, did you go to the doctors? He said, yes. He said, and they told you that this is leukemia? He said, yes. I said, did you go for an HIV test? He said, yes. I said, what was the result? He said, um, they said, they said it was positive. Then, to my amazement, he looked at me rather startled. I, already, he couldn't walk. He was shaky, sickly, looking 
like he was dying. Then he said to me, but please, I don't want you to say it out. Here, right here in front. I don't want you to say it out. I said, why? I, said, I don't want people to know. Then I said to him, if you are healed, then it will not be there again. If you are not healed, they will still know. Because you'll die. You see, his pride was still there. Even though he was sick and the doctors had given him up to die. He actually said he was going to see the doctors the next day. He said he has an appointment with the doctor the next day. Then I, I said, you can go back. I couldn't pray for him. His faith will not work. There's no faith there. As long as you're saying, um, I really want you to pray for me, but please don't put me on TV. Ha! Huh. You are not ready to be healed. You think you have faith. You don't. How many of you watched Love Warrior today? There was something remarkable uh, during the um, Rhapsody section. Did you see the Rhapsody section? Very interesting. Uh, they were talking about... Um, um, two blind men Jesus healed and Jesus said don't tell anybody a and they were sharing that Jesus must have had a great sense of humor <laughs> and I thought so as I listened to it's because Jesus said don't tell anybody in other words just go home now the blind men didn't know anybody by face you agree with that because they were born blind so if they were walking down the streets, they didn't know anybody that they knew before by face. They would only recognize someone by the voice. Agreed with me? Good. Now, Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Don't you think, Jesus, Jesus was smart, I'm telling you. He knew they didn't have to say nothing. Because if they said, I was blind, I was blind, now I see. Those who didn't know them would only say, what's happening to you? So Jesus said, relax, just go home. Because Jesus knew if you had somebody in your house or in your estate who went out and you knew he was born blind, who went out and came back seeing, he wouldn't have to tell you nothing. So Jesus was not teaching how to hide a miracle. You get it? He knew there will be commotion the moment you show up. The, the others will tell the story. <laughs> then, the other man who was mad, <laughs> I think he really had a great sense of humor. <laughs> I think he really had a great sense of humor. The guy was insane. Jesus cast the devils out of him. And then he said, go back home and go tell everybody. You know why? Because he knew the man was insane. And the moment he showed up, they would start running away. Nobody by his quietness will think that he was healed. So Jesus said, announce it. Tell everybody. <laughs> Praise God. So when people are questioning, why do you have to let others know about the miracles? Jesus told them to go home and keep quiet. Tell them no. Jesus was smarter than that. He didn't say keep quiet. Throughout the Bible, the only times he told people not to say anything, they went ahead and said it. Did Jesus reprimand them for it? No. But the one who didn't say anything, we do read in the Bible that Jesus reprimanded him. You see it now? Yeah. You can't just be quiet when God does something for you. Tell it. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we're talking about demonstrating your faith in God. It's so important. If you believe in Him, you have to act it. Your sickness does not change your person. Your condition does not change your person. If you have no money, it doesn't mean that you're no longer a person. You still have your self, uh, self-value. Your personality, your ego is still there. And that's the reason you feel it. I don't mean feel it physically. I, I mean, that's the reason it troubles you. That's the reason sometimes you feel ashamed. Is that you? But here's the point. If you believe in Jesus Christ, how so far in your life have you demonstrated it? A man has been in a church for years, a Christian. He has never demonstrated his believing in God. Then he falls sick. Do you think prayer will heal him? It's unlikely. A man who has never demonstrated his faith in God and has been a Christian, prayer cannot heal him. It is only the demonstration of his faith in God that will save him. I told you to read something. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 21, he said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is the man's treasure? His treasure has been in the house he's building. His treasure has been in the next business he wants to open. Watch it. He's a Christian. His treasure has been in the holidays he wants to spend in Hawaii. His treasure has been in setting up something for the future for his children. Where is his treasure? His treasure is in politics. His treasure has been distributed to all those things. Where do you think his heart is? Jesus has nailed it right there. He says the man's heart will be where his treasure is. So even though he has been in church for years, his treasure is not in God. Which means his heart is not in God. If your heart is not in God, your faith is not in God. If trouble strikes, no amount of prayer meeting will change it. Because your faith in God, do you know what is after you? Can I? You're, you're here, aren't you? Some of you here, before you were born again, you were deeply involved with the devil. There's so many things, you know, that time will not allow us to talk about today. Maybe we'll go on in some other service. There are things that happen to people that they cannot explain. Things that happen to people that they cannot explain. Spiritual things. Man is a spirit. Satanism is holding sway today over Europe. Why? Because many of God's children there have refused to recognize the reality of the spiritual realm. 
But the Satanists are growing by the day. They're having a few day. But not for long. Amen. It will not be for long. Not for long. Here is a lady who constantly has problems with the husband. She has difficulty having children. But always in something that is more than a dream. She has a man who is a spirit being who comes to make love to her. Do you think he's go- she's going to be free? The man will always have problems with her because she has another husband. Let's just be practical. How many of you here, God has saved you, thank God. He has delivered you from that evil and you had such an experience. Don't be ashamed. God's, God's done, I mean, He's brought you out. How many of you had such an experience? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm talking about this this thing was more than a dream. It used to happen to you. Let me deal with the ladies now. It was more than a dream. But it was not physical like, you know, the people you know. Let me see your hand. You're in the house of God. It's a testimony. God set you free from it. Thank you. And you knew it was more than a dream. We're not, we're not talking about uh, wet dreams now. No, wet dreams are a very different uh, set of <laughs> problems. <laughs> oh yeah, those are problems, but they are a different set of problems. And they insist that this person belongs to them, these evil spirits of darkness. Many, many times, as, as you read the Bible, all the major meetings that Jesus had, he cast out devils. Why? Because man's major problems are caused by demons. The frustrations that people have are usually caused by demons. Sometimes you have someone who is fighting for your position at the office. What do you think is happening? Your Christianity must go beyond the general. It must go beyond the general. The other man's life is not your life. Understand it. What you are dealing with is different. Let's look at the negative world. The spiritual world. What what these people do. How, How many of you ever, nowadays, you know, Satan has made his work a little more sophisticated. I want you to know that. Now he builds beautiful buildings. He knows that in this generation it's very hard for people to look for a shrine far in the bush. He used to do that. He used to take them in there. All right? Now he's not doing that. Like many, many years ago, he brought forth giants through sexual intercourse um, between fallen angels and human beings. He brought forth giants because the fight in those days was physical. Now he knows it's no longer physical so he's not bringing forth his kids as giants. Physical giants. He has to come another way. It's more spiritual now. It's more intellectual now. So he moves in that arena now. So you find a beautiful building, painted white, looking clean, smallish, cute, nice. The compound, so, I mean, you love the garden. Very well-dressed security men, golden gates. You say, I think something nice must be happening here. It's quiet and they are friendly. They welcome you as you approach. Oh, you're welcome. Broad smiles as they take that fellow in. And then he goes through all those rituals. Terrible rituals. Never to return to reality again. The only thing that saves him is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The obonies of yesteryears are no longer hiding. 
It's no longer called a secret court. Listen, these are no more secret courts. They are now in the open. They have transformed themselves. It's a new style. They don't go by those terrible names of many years ago. They go by newer names. They now have their things written in books. It used to be an old man with revelations only. Never went to school. That gave them the laws and the regulations. Now, his great-grandchildren who have gone to the university have written books. And they are delivering the books in coded languages. It is now more sophisticated. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? It has changed, but it's the same devil. You need to know what you're up against in life. Life is not just as simple as you're seeing it. Somebody says, I just want an easy life. There is none. There is none. The Bible says that the adversary, the devil, walk it about like a roaring lion seeking seeking whom he may devour seeking whom he may devour if you're a christian in this room today i'm telling you what the word of god says he says be sober be vigilant in other words don't take it lightly Somebody said, I just want a quiet life, you know. I don't trouble the devil and the devil doesn't trouble me. <laughs> Somebody said, if you don't give the devil trouble, he will not trouble, he just leave you. He will not. I said, he will not. He has a timetable. That's what the Bible says. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. It says, put on the whole armor. The armor is for the defensive. That you may be able to stand against the wires, the stratagems of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He says that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Because it's not every day. In the evil day. What is the evil day? It's Satan's day for you. In the evil day. The day of crisis. The day where you're the target of the adversary. He has them watching through that fence. You don't know how many times they've come to you. And I'm not talking about your fence at home. No! God has a fence around you. And the devil keeps checking. He keeps checking. For the Bible says, He that breaketh the hedge, the serpent will bite him. If you break the hedge, he's waiting for you to break the hedge. He keeps watching. Every time he comes, there's that fire of God around you. He goes. But what? Seeking whom he may devour. When he comes, your fence, your hedge is intact. He goes to the other one. The fence is intact. He keeps watching. Satan has his kids all around the place watching. Then someone has broken it. Whew. There he comes. Depending on the strategy of the devil. Sometimes I've seen people with cancer grown so big. How did it start? I say, it was like a, a mosquito bite. You'd be amazed. I scratched it. The next thing I knew, it was like a boil. I tried to treat it. It got bigger. Before long, it was bigger and then bigger. Became like an egg. I went to the doctor. They said I have to have an operation. They cut it. It grew larger. Today is larger than the head. These things are not ordered by themselves. 
They are not ordered by themselves. And that's one reason you have to be careful who you marry. You have to be careful. If you're already married, don't try to come out. <laughs> you're already in there. Can help you come out. You come out of the problem, not out of the marriage now. But you have to be careful. Walking in the will of God is the best for you. Because one of Satan's strategy, strategies is to get people through sex. you have sex with a lady with demons you are sure to have them come into your life why? it's a covenant it's a blood covenant cannot be broken they must come into your life and if a devil is walking in someone's life he can be quiet for a season did you ever read that the devil tempted Jesus and Jesus defeated him through the word of God then the Bible says, and the devil leaveth him for a season. A season. He came back. If he tempted Jesus and left him for a season, what do you think he was doing? He went to watch him from afar. And then heard Jesus talking about he was going to die. He showed up again. This time, in another way. Through one of his disciples. And Jesus discovered him. Put not your trust in men. Are you hearing me? Put not your trust in men. A woman sacrificed her daughter for her wealth. She wanted riches. She went to an old woman who had did you. They said the woman was powerful. She said, help me, I come from a very poor home. I don't want my family to remain poor. I want you to help me. Because I want to help my family. You want the devil to help you? Help your family? Well, she was desperate. She needed help. So she talked to the woman. The woman said, all right. See me on such a day. She went away. She said when she came back to the woman, to the old juju priest or priestess, the lady said, I've seen something. It is possible. But it will be very expensive. She said, what? Anything it will cost, I'm ready. She said, it's very expensive. I'm ready. It will cost you your second daughter. What about give your second daughter? Give? Oh no, we will not take her from you. But give her to us. And you will be as rich as you want to be. She will be with you. But give her to us. Why? Because the spirit of riches, that's what she was told, the spirit of riches will live inside her. But as long as that spirit of riches is inside her to benefit you, she will not be able to do anything for you. She said, okay. She didn't have to carry her daughter there. They gave her something to give her daughter to eat. The daughter ate it. And the next thing, an evil spirit came into her. She became sick. They went from doctor. To, they never told her that this lady would be sick. They didn't tell her mother that. The husband didn't know anything. The siblings didn't know anything. They started going from doctor to doctor. Everyone said, we don't know what is wrong. Nothing is wrong. 
but she was sick. She couldn't go to school. She couldn't do anything. She was always at home. Sick. Sometimes she would lose her mind. Sometimes she would destroy things in the house. But the woman was getting businesses. Life changed. Before long. I mean, things just started happening. You understand? Things just started happening. She would get into a place and there's favor. Favor from who? From the devil. The same people who were involved in the spirit realm. And the devil would organize them. They'll give her business, contracts. She was getting bigger, buying vehicles, building houses. Family changed. But the second daughter, every time she entered the house, she knew she did something. She couldn't tell anybody. But she was looking for help. What did she want to do? Play the devil? The devil was inside the girl. Possessed her. No school, nothing. At home. Like a drunk. Like a fool. And she could behave in any direction. But mommy had become wealthy. But the wealth could not show in her second daughter. See, no matter how rich you are, even if you have 100 children, if one is sick, if you are a true mother or father, it will hit you. So the devil knew what he was doing. The woman was not free. Your faith in God, you must demonstrate in action. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Prayer is not enough. Your faith in God must be demonstrated. Your faith in God must be demonstrated. Now, people will do anything to receive from the devil. I want to read something to you. The book of Micah. M I C A H. Just turn to the table of contents if you don't know where it is. How many of you know that God is a spirit? How many of you know? You know that God is not a man? No, talk to me now. How many of you know that God is not a man? I don't think you all know. Do you think God is a man? You think God is a man? Look at me. Is God a man? God is a spirit. The Bible calls him the father of spirits. He's a spirit, not a man. You must demonstrate your faith in him in your action. Let me show you. Micah chapter 6. I am reading from verse 6. Ready? Oh, that's not enthusiastic. Come on. Thank you. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Hmm. 
Look at the next verse. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? In other words, hey, get corrected. Listen to this. He's telling you that you cannot appease God for your sin. Alright? By giving him thousands of rams, rivers of oil, even your firstborn. He says there is no amount of sacrifice with which you can appease God for your sins. Okay? But then he shows, he shows you what you ought to do, how to respond to God. And then he says, wisdom. He says, God's voice cries in the city. And the man of wisdom is the one who will hear it. First, turn to Genesis. Chapter 28. From verse 20. Or let, let's take it from verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. It's possible for God to be present somewhere and you don't know it. Hallelujah. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that place was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow. Now, I want you to notice this. Jacob vowed what? A vow. Now, God is a covenant-keeping God. I, I want to show you spiritual things now. Very, very important. And you have to be all ears now. All right. Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat. And raiment to put on. If God will be with me. He says if he will keep me in this way that I go. And give me bread to eat. And raiment to put on. So that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tent unto thee. Now the Bible says that Jacob made a vow. He made a vow. He was out of home, running away from his brother. Escaping for his dear life. He's come out to start a new life somewhere. God manifests himself to him in a dream. The man makes a vow. If God will be with me. Take care of me. Feed me. Clothe me. Then the Lord shall be my God. Then he set a place of worship. This shall be God's house. And of all that you will give me, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. You know what he's doing? He's making a commitment to God. A commitment for the demonstration of his faith. I said, you have been a Christian all these years. Where is the demonstration of your faith? Where is it? The 
the problems they're praying for you about, do you think that if these problems would go, that new ones will not come? If you want permanent prosperity, if you want permanent health, you want... See, the blessings of God are given to us in one package. Are you hearing me? The salvation of God comes to us in one package. It's all in one package. They don't come one after the other. They're all in one package. But you are the one to demonstrate your faith in God to keep you in it. Turn to Second Kings. This is a very, you know, to, to a lot of people it's very controversial. A very po- powerful portion of the Bible. But the, it teaches us so much, so much, so much, so much. We read just now that even if you gave your firstborn to God, he said your sin will not still be forgiven. Did he say that? Yes. Because that is not what God wants. What does he want? To walk in righteousness. Which has been given to us in Christ Jesus. There is one sacrifice necessary. And that's the one Jesus did for us. But don't misunderstand God. Look here. In chapter 3. How many of you have seen those people who, who make, they, they swear for their enemies? Have you seen those things? Have you seen people doing that? All right? So make, I don't know what, the, some kind of sacrifices put in certain junctions. And anybody... Who is coming to this place for evil? They say, we surely die. But they put that sacrifice in that place. Who do you think they offered it to? Demons. The Bible says the sacrifices that the heathen offer, they offer to demons and not to God. They offer them to demons. When you find in the occult, they drink blood. Is that correct? Uh, Some of you have been there. Yes, the Bible talks about them. They drink blood. And when they drink blood, they believe that they are higher now. Is that, am I right? How many of you were in such... Don't worry, we won't ask you whose blood it was. Just, did they ever make you drink blood in the court? Let me see your hand up. You have to be honest, God is here. Let me see your hand. Did they make you drink blood? Ah, you have to be honest today. I'm waiting for a response. (laughs) Did any of you ever join the court? Okay, that means you are not a strong one. No, for very strong ones, they would give them something like that to drink. To be very strong. So they, they they would promote them according to that kind of sacrifice. That they can make available and, and they also would drink. Now, this is the thing I want to say. There is no power, spiritual or physical, in that blood that they are drinking to change their state. Alright? It is the faith demonstrated in that ritual that is powerful. Are you still here? The guy takes that cup, he drinks the blood, and they tell him he's now in another level. He believes he's higher because he has taken the life of another man and added to his own life. That's what he thinks. Because the blood is the life of the flesh. 
So he drinks the blood. The Bible says the blood is the life of the flesh. So he drinks that blood and he believes he has added more life to his own life. He is now, if he had been supernatural, he is now super, supernatural. <laughs> you see, the devil lies to him. But the power in that thing is his faith in that thing that he's drinking. His faith in it. He believes. Do you think you that are without faith can come against a man who drank another person's blood? You can't fight him. Until you drink blood too. You have to... Look, let me show you something. If all these sicknesses and diseases of people to whom we minister are actually caused by terrible, uh, infectious conditions, and then some of them by devils, these are all wicked things, wicked elements. If they are so wicked, how come we are not afraid of them? It must mean that we have something which we believe has dominion over them. Why are we not afraid of them? There must be something else. I said it is not the content of that glass that is the thing. It is the faith in the content of the glass. The faith in what it represents. That is where the power is. For example, this book has no power of its own. But my faith in what the content represents is where the power is. Can I? Are you ready to read this now? Here was a king surrounded by three nations. The king of Moab was surrounded. His whole nation was surrounded by three other nations that besieged his nation. God said to those other three kings, Go, you will surely defeat the king of Moab. I want you to understand this. God was against the king of Moab. God said to the other three, You can go, you will defeat him. And they went. All right. We are now in Second Kings chapter three, verse twenty six. Chapter three. Verse 26, Second Kings, chapter number 3. Oh, hallelujah. Leba kandradigasta. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you ready? Chapter 3, verse 26. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too strong for him. Listen. They were against him. He was, his army was outnumbered I don't know who your competitors are today I don't know where you stand in your life today I don't know what you are up against today if only you knew how to demonstrate your faith in the God you serve if only if only Instead of thinking that prayer alone will do it. Prayer can do it. After you have come into Christ, the demonstration of your faith is your way of success. Your prayer becomes prayer of praise and worship and intercession. 
You have nothing to ask for yourself anymore. By faith, you appropriate God's word for yourself. You act your faith and reign in Christ. That's what life is supposed to be. God has not brought you into a beggarly life. Begging for healing, begging for prosperity, begging for a job, begging and pleading. That's not your life in Christ. Now let's look at this. Remember, God was against this man. All right? But let's see something. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was too strong for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom. But they could not. Now listen. Remember, three nations are against him, fighting him. So when he saw that the battle was too strong, he took 700 of his most powerful men and decided to look for the weakest point of his adversaries and located the king of Edom. He decided to approach through the Edomites with his 700 strongest men of war. So they decided to break through this area. The Bible says they could not. What efforts have you made for your problem? In America, they know about it. In Japan, they know about it. They know of the same problem that you have in the UK. You have tried everywhere. You have done everything. If it's a business, you have tried so much, you now decided to get certain people to join you. But they could not. 700 men. You got more powerful shareholders. Hmm? Business partners. To break through Satan's weakest point. For this man, the Bible says, they could not. You know what the word of God is showing you? That this man was a strategist. He was a strategist. And he had become a powerful man. Otherwise, he wouldn't need three nations to fight him. And those three nations had to consult God first. Showing that the man was powerful. They needed supernatural help to, con- to, 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 to defeat him. Conquer his nation. And God said, go. You will defeat him. And they went. And they pressed upon him. And he did his best. His best failed. Bible says then. Verse 27. Everybody say then. 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 Okay. Look at what he did. Then he took his eldest son. That should have reigned in his stead. And offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great anger, great indignation against Israel. And they departed from him. Did you hear that? The enemy retreated. He took his eldest son. That should have reigned in his stead. Look, at this point, you're dealing with a man who has taken... This was his life. If he killed himself, it would not solve it. They would take over his nation still. What did he do? He took his most priceless possession. His eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him. And the Bible says there was anger against Israel. God's people whom God said you will defeat that man. There was anger. What we study here is not the rightness of him killing his son. For God has already told us that those are not the things. It's not the ram. It's not the son. It's not this or that. 
It is the quality of a man's sacrifice. The man offered his son upon the wall. In other words, everybody saw it. It was upon the wall. When he did, there was anger against Israel. Was it the anger of the Edomites against the Israelites? No! Which means death began to reign over them. They began to kill themselves. They began to die. The power of God went against them. What suddenly changed the course of the battle? What changed the direction of victory? It was a man's sacrifice. Some of you, what you are sick of, if the doctor told you to sell everything you have to pay for a new kidney, you will do it. But your faith in God has never been clearly demonstrated. How can you defeat a devil that is hell-bent in destroying you? Look at this. Not even God stood against the man's sacrifice. That's the reason some non-Christians will go and offer sacrifices to the cult that they, they belong to and can take a job from a Christian that is praying and crying. They take a job from you. You are the MD of so 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 company. There's another man that wants your position. But you are praying and speaking in tongues and offering general sacrifices. There is someone there who is offering in the realm of the spirit more powerful sacrifices than yourself. In the realm of the spirit, the tide will change against you. Why a man's faith is demonstrated by his action. It's not by his prayer. He says, where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. Where is your treasure? Is it in God? What did God say? My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Give me your heart. How are you truly able to give God your heart but your treasure is somewhere else? It's not possible. But you don't know. So we think that as we are doing, this is a spiritual life. Understand it. It's spiritual. This is the missing element in the lives of many Christians. This is the missing element of faith that they don't understand. This is where it is. They are giving is the life of contribution. You understand? Okay, let, we want to build something. Let's contribute. We want to, let's contribute. Contribution. It's not, there's something more than that. It is a man's faith in demonstration. Something more than that. Not your giving of contribution. There's something much more than that. It is, this is a life between you and your God. Between you and your God. Look at our Holy Communion. I told you, I said, how can you defeat a man who has taken blood and is walking against you? The demons that go with him will be increased. You see, the power in the spirit, let me tell you this, the power in the spirit is not in your muscles. The power you wield in the realm of the spirit is the number of demons or the number of angels that go with you. Because the battle is in the realm of the spirit, not in the physical. When I say in the name of Jesus, I command blind eyes to open. When I say that, angels are working, working. Now, how many of you saw increased miracles during this last program? 
Why? Because the number of angels going with us have increased. So you have increased manifestations in every way. Look at what we're doing. What, at the same time, we're working towards the same, two different programs. Camp meeting alone with all that construction cost millions of naira. And we lacked nothing. Which means increased finances. The financing went up to surplus. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? The power you have in the spirit will be indicated first by your demonstration of faith in God. And that promotes you. It moves you into the next level. And at the next level, there are angels that go with you. More than the previous level. When you say a native doctor is very strong, it's the number of demons that go with him. I watched, see, I used to go on crusades in the villages many years ago. I know about a, a lot of spiritual things. I don't know, some of you here, if you... Did you ever watch a fight between native doctors, rainmakers, I've had, I've had the privilege of seeing certain things. And they were fighting with these things in the clouds. And the one who pushed the clouds over to that other side. And the clouds move. And then you see again uh, to the other side. And the elderly men in the village are telling us what is happening. They say it's the rainmakers, the ones over in this area. They are the ones fighting with those ones over there. Said so the weaker the weaker one will bow. These ones don't want rain. They are going to move it to that side and cause rain to spoil things over there. And those ones are resisting. And we say, Wow. You see the movement. It's not something you it's not in a dream. You sit down and you'll be watching. Sometimes you see some of, you know, many of them are used to it, but you see some people out watching. They know what is going on. I've come in among Juju worshippers in a crusade when we went to their shrine. Over 200 of them in full regalia when they surrounded us. It's another day story. They came out dancing, dancing around us. <laughs> in red it's horrible horrible and they would drum hey. ah. because they were angry with us they said we have come to defy their shrine and that we will not live there alive But many times, we had to also demonstrate the power of God openly in their presence. i never forget 986. When we stopped the rain for four days, because we were there for a crusade. At the end of it, that night, I said, let me now tell you, we stopped this rain four days ago. And the crowd, you know, now so many people have been healed, many had given their lives to Christ and were about to close and leave. I said, for you to know that we were the ones that stopped the rain. Because it was raining season. I said, I'm going to pray now and ask God to send down this rain. Now. With their eyes open and I was on the platform I said in the name of Jesus that they may know that we stopped this rain in your name. I command the rains to come down. Why I yet prayed. There had been no clouds. 
Are you hearing me? There had been no clouds. Suddenly, the place was thick with clouds and the rains came down. While I was still on the platform, we were soaked to the pads. Somebody asked me where we were going. You should have waited. Oh. <laughs> I said, no, they wouldn't believe. So everybody went home wet. They had to believe. What am I telling you? The spiritual realm is real. Don't kid yourself. You have to plan now. Live right now. Do the right thing now. Against the evil day. Demonstrate your faith in God. And when you demonstrate your faith in God, it should become a lifestyle. Are you hearing me? It should become a lifestyle. Don't play smart with God. Don't play smart. Because the Bible says that He watches our actions. His word discerns our thoughts, our motives. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Today, you can be smart and say, oh God, make a vow like, like, like Jacob. Don't say, oh, I'm vowing for the building. How many of you vow $10,000 for, for, for building? Hey, no. This is, you see, wisdom is a defense. There are people who... On, Turn to the book of Psalms. I'll, I'll begin to round off here. You ready? I'm reading Psalm 116 from verse 1. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading to you from... I'll read from verse 1. Just a moment. From verse 1, I love the Lord because he had heard my voice and my supplications, because he had inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me. I, I want you to see the man's situation when he prayed. He says, I, I love the Lord because he had heard my voice and my supplications. See, when I prayed to God, he said, he heard me. Then he says, look at what I want you. Verse 2. Because he had inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low. And he helped me. Hallelujah. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? He says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. He says, I will pay my vows. Now turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, quickly. <clears throat> Are you there? From verse 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God... Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 4. When thou vowest the vow unto God, defer not to pay it. That means delay not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Did you hear that? Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Have you seen that? Now when you read about vows in the scriptures, 
I'm not talking about vows today. But you see, it's so important that you get to understand all these things. A vow to God does not mean when you say, okay, I vow one million naira for the tiring of the road. No. A vow to God is a covenant. I want you to understand this. Men use vows to get themselves out of trouble and to connect themselves with God. Men used vows. We read about Jacob a moment ago. When you study, in the, you study the Psalms, you find how important vows were to David. David said, vow and pay to the Lord. What is a vow? It's a statement of commitment that's based on conditions. Now here, the man says, oh God, say Listen, listen, listen. You, you, you that are in need of a special touch from God today. Listen. We're talking about a God who is a spirit and not a man. You're not dealing with a man. It's not on friendly terms like your neighbor at your backyard. We're talking of a spirit being. The one called the father of spirits. Here you're going through a terrible situation in your life. You go before the Lord and you say, Lord, I make a vow today. If you will bring me out of this thing, I will do this. It's not a business transaction. Like some people say, oh God, this contract is worth 5 million. You think you want to bribe God? If you will help me get it, 1.5 is yours. (laughs) No. No. God is not in that realm. He's not, he's not into that kind of business. You don't deceive him. You don't use him to get a business. Not, not that way. It's a vow of worship and commitment. The statements are heavy. They're not light. And you're not dealing with him like a man. Even at that point of your making that vow, look at Jacob. The Bible says he poured oil upon the stone and worshipped and said, Oh God, if you will be with me. He said, This stone that I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. Of all that you will give me, I will surely give the tent unto thee. Already he knew that he was supposed to give his tithe. So he's not bribing God with something new. Are you hearing me? He's not trying to bribe him with something new. He's making a commitment. Lord, all that I have is yours. This, it's from his heart. A decision, a commitment, a statement of commitment. And when God sees that heart, he moves into action on your behalf. Then he waits for you to do your own part. Because you must do your part. But do you know, many did not do their part when God did for them. They failed there. They were tested and they failed. So we read in Ecclesiastes, he says, when you vow, don't delay. Don't delay to pay it. He says, because God has no pleasure in fools, which means he has called such people fools. Why? Because it's going to work against you and you don't realize it. You think you already have it made. But this thing's going to work against you. You're just not seeing it now. That's what God is saying. Tell somebody, demonstrate your faith in God. Talk to yourself now. Say, demonstrate your faith in God. Tell yourself. Demonstrate your faith in God. God is not a man. He is a God and not a man. Lift your right hand towards heaven and just worship Him. Worship Him now. What will you do for Him? If you are healed today, if that cancer leaves your body today, will you serve Him? How will you commit yourself to Him? If God turns your life into the vision that you are seeing. What will you do for him? 
so far in your Christianity? What has the kingdom of God benefited from your coming to Christ? Where is your treasure? With all the salvation that Jesus has given to you, what has the kingdom of God received from you? Where is your commitment to Him?